take the risk and ask for it. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the gendered relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and our guest today is Dr. Julie Scanlon, and here are three things you want to know about Julie before we start. She has been running Julie Scanlon Consultancy, which focuses on diversity and inclusion since 2017. Uh, she is an executive coach through Newcastle Business School and Cary Grant bought her family farm in Ireland. Welcome, Julie. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Great to be here with you. <laughs> it's going to be fun. I hope It's going to be very informative for me, I got to tell you that. Uh, to our listeners, Julie volunteered to talk with me when I was really short on recorded podcasts. N now I have a whole bunch backed up, so, so you're probably going to hear this two months after we've recorded it. But specifically, she wants to talk about women and men entrepreneurs and their attitudes towards pricing. Uh, Julie, what got you interested in this topic? Thank you, Mark. Um, I have a longstanding interest in uh, sex and gender through used to be an academic for many years, a previous career. Um, I'm in my early 50s now, and I left to set up my consultancy around six, seven years ago. Um, and gender has always been a key part of that. Uh, now that I'm in the entrepreneurship kind of space and um, self-employed space, I just throw my lens onto the things like the gender pay gap in this space too. So I think that's pretty fair. Um, now, to be upfront in the beginning, I got to tell you that I try to treat everybody as individuals, right? It doesn't matter who it is. So I, I really don't think about gender, although I can confess that there are probably two places in business that I, I stereotype genders, but, mm -hmm. but I still treat people as individuals. So it doesn't matter to me, right? Um, and so let's do the first one, which I think is the one that you care the most about. And that is, I get the feeling that women are less confident than men about their pricing, about their business. Um, I'm not sure I would use that word confidence. Um, okay. I think there are a whole set of parameters that mean that we might make different decisions around pricing, um, especially value-based pricing. Um, and these will be the way that we are potentially perceived in the world, so by clients as um, as perhaps bringing different kind of things to the table. Um, I think there are ways that we are uh, imbibe and kind of interpolate different things as men and women as we are socialized in the way that we value ourselves and those kinds of things that we can bring. Um, and just to put some data on that, as people will hear, I uh, have an English accent. I'm based in the UK. And some uh, some data around that um, that we have from the Association for Independent Professionals and the Self-Employed, or IPSI for short, found a few years ago that there was a 43% differential between um, rates that uh, men were charging to women. Um, and that is, that's an enormous differential to me. So these would be, you know, independent professionals and self-employed people. So people in that kind of entrepreneurship space. So the data is telling us something really big is going on. Um, and the, we don't have enough kind of exploration in terms of looking at the causes. I don't think it's necessarily about confidence per se. It's about perhaps, um, are women perceived differently? Do we get what we ask for? Uh, in the same way that men might do um, and, you know, don't want to overly stereotype, but there's clearly that kind of differential there, which needs uh, to explore what the evidence is behind that. And we don't have that. We don't have that evidence as yet. Well, I don't like that answer. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. So, so, so I think that 43% is huge. Oh my gosh. It's massive. Um, and so what I don't like is the answer that says, um, 
we don't think it's lack of confidence. Well, we're not sure it's lack of confidence and we don't know the answer, right? Cause it, cause it feels, gosh, men. Okay. Here we go. Stereotyping, but this is the same stereotype. So it's okay. Uh, so men uh, sometimes are just super overconfident, right? They think they are worth so much than they really are. They think they deliver so much value than they really do. Um, but by the way, that's not all men. Some men are underconfident or undervalue themselves. Yeah. But I certainly see that way more in men than I do in women in terms of overcharging or overpricing. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and, and so if it's not confidence, I, I can't picture what it is. Uh, cause, cause I don't, gosh, when I buy things, I don't care if it's a woman or a man, right? When I buy services, it just doesn't matter to me. Mm. Uh, in fact, most of my team is women, um, because I think they tend to do better work than men do, honestly. <laughs> nice to hear you say that. <laughs> so, so what, uh, what, take a guess for me. What do you think it is if it's not confidence? Yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. There's there's the element of confidence in there, but it's how that um, how those parameters come about where men feel uh, potentially that they are that their services are worth more, that they are worth more in the world, and so all of this messaging that men uh, receive like from the media, from from knowing things like the gender pay gap, from all the representations, we're getting all of those signals all of the time. So they are telling us our place in some ways. And we kind of, we take that in and we think this is my place potentially. Like not everyone, we're not, you know, really don't want to wish to, to stereotype. But that's not necessarily about... Um, a woman needing to go on confidence training, for example, it's actually about how we interpret, uh, interpolate those messages. Uh, a, it's about the messages that we receive from the social world, but it's also about how we, uh, how we manage and kind of interact with that, that messaging, if you see what I mean. So there will be an element of confidence in there, but what I don't want to, uh, kind of listeners to come away with, I guess, is that women have some kind of confidence deficit because there's also been data and research done that when women ask for, um, this is kind of in the employed space, but when if you ask for a salary rise or if you ask for a, a higher start uh, rate in terms of a, a role, you're less likely to get it if you're a woman. So it, it's not that we're not asking in the same way that men are, but it might also be that, well, it is also there's different kind of biases that are going on in the world that mean actually sometimes we don't get what we ask for. Um, so I think it's, it's an interesting one. And there was, if I can touch on a, a very recent example in the UK, um, we had uh, a couple of journalists being interviewed on uh, Sky News here, which is a kind of big uh, kind of news channel about misogyny. Um, and it was a live interview. And in the live interview, both of the journalists, the male, female, uh, the male journalist and the female journalist realized the female journalist was not being paid for this interview and the male journalist was. Now, what that is about um, is, you know, how come he was offered or who was, uh, you know, who kind of the people behind that show know that there's that disparity. He was offered a sum of money and the woman wasn't offered a sum of money. And this came out live. So there's something going on. That, that's not about the woman's confidence. Uh, you know, uh, there's something there about unequal treatment kind of being seen as being okay in some ways. So it's a perfect, it's happened like about a week ago here in the UK. So it's very yeah. live in my head in relation to the conversation. Yeah, yeah it's it's interesting. <sighs> God, I, I, I'm so reluctant to share, but now that I said those words, I have no choice. I have to share this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I want to take that comment directly back to confidence for a second and say, I think that women accepting lower amounts causes the problem or women accepting the interview without pay causes the problem. Um, because she could easily say, no, I don't do that without pay. And, and by the way, he might've done that. I'm, I'm quite often asked, Hey, can you come speak for free? And I'll say no. And then they'll find money and they'll pay me to come speak. 
Um, and so it may have been that I, I have no idea what the, what the situation is, but, um, in my world, in my way of thinking of the world, I can't control anybody else, right? I can't tell you, Hey, you can't offer women this and men that, but what I can do is I can coach people to say, what's your value and how do you capture your own value? Um, and, and that's what I would be doing in this situation. I would be thinking about women and saying, look, you know, you don't, don't accept this. You're, you're worth way more than that. Mm. But if you haven't got that coach in your ear and you feel that it's normal, that nobody's getting paid for this interview, you turn up and you do it. Um, you know, I'm not getting paid to speak with you, Mark, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not asking for that. Obviously, this is a Funny, different Julie, scenario. Neither, neither am I. No. <laughs> Equitable space, wonderful. There we go. <laughs> um, this is a different scenario than a national news channel um, where you're being brought on as a pundit. Um, and I just guess, you know, unless you have that, the you know, it's only in. I've been on on TV shows before, and I've never asked for pay. I didn't know that people got paid. Next time, I will ask, you know, and I will set a fee, or I'll ask what their fee is. I didn't even know that people got paid. So some people. So there's like, how do you even get in that space? Like it's, it hasn't been about confidence. It hasn't been about, uh, you know, kind of there's something around that expectation that, um, that, that it's just an unknown. I find it quite fascinating. Okay. So I'm playing devil's advocate for a second, right? Go on. By the way, I, I love the, what we're talking about, I think, isn't the 43% difference because I think that's a huge, huge problem, right? I mean, it's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. But um, I would argue that if I were being interviewed, they wouldn't offer me the money either unless I asked for it. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. I think it's who knows and who asks Yeah, is probably the issue because companies are cheap. They don't want to pay any of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's right. Who knows and who asks is, is vital there. And that comes down to you know, thinking about back again, the entrepreneurship space and um, there being little transparency when we set our own prices, when we're practicing value-based pricing, there is so little transparency about what other competitors might be, uh, you know, might be offering. So we might, we might, our, even our ballpark, because it's an art, not a science, even our ballpark is, all over the place. Um, and so there's, there's something I wonder about transparency. If, if we, uh, in particular spaces like coaching space or the finance sector, et cetera, and working as independent professionals, could our professional bodies be doing a little bit more around that transparency, um, of even what ballpark figures might look like? Um, and I think that in the coaching world, the, some of that I'm seeing is starting to happen. Um, we see a bigger, uh, um, we see a big range, but at least we still do see a range so that people can't, well, hopefully people are not um, significantly undervaluing themselves. Yeah. Let me ask a slightly different question. Um, we all hate hearing the word no, right? We don't, we don't want to mm. lose deals. We don't want to get turned down. Um, but I have to tell you, my business attitude changed when I decided I didn't care if someone said no to me. Yeah. Right. If I could just set a high price and someone said, no, I'm not going to pay that. It's like, yep. Okay. Got it. Right. Yeah. And, and so is there a, do you think there's a gender thing there or do you think that's just a maturity or a, 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 a self comfort place? Mm, that's a fascinating question. Thanks. I think I know that there has been some research in the academic space around women being, um, taking a little longer to come back sometimes after that rejection, after that no. Um, so uh, again, not wishing to overly generalize, but there's something about us being, like the stereotypes out there about us being kind of servers as women, you know, the, the people that are there to, to sort of hold everything up and hold everything in space. So that getting that kind of no um, has been more problematic. I know in, uh, in, People that do academic research, for example, it will take a woman um, 
the data tells us that, that, that you know the evidence are based around it that's telling us that it will take a woman longer if she gets her paper rejected an academic paper rejected it'll take a longer to build up to sending that out again to another journal than um than for a male academic that's just something that's come out the top of my head um so i think there is something as you say none of us like hearing that word no but i'm wondering some of the ways that we're socialized and acculturated might make that a bit of a gender differential in terms of men might be more likely to be oh well okay on to the next one kind of re recover as it were more quick more quickly that's what that research element is sort of reminding me of that you've uh, talked about there okay so so now i want you to help me out for a second as I already said, I can't control the outside world, right? I, I can't control your buyers or anybody's buyers. But what I can do is I can coach or help individual entrepreneurs or companies that are that are run by women or run by men. How should I be thinking differently as I coach women run companies or women entrepreneurs? Mm. Mark, this is a wonderful question for me because I've just done a whole podcast series on coaching women. <laughs> <laughs> understand i'm not an executive coach okay I, I teach people about pricing and value yeah yeah no absolutely um i'm i think you know in that series but in, in my in my answer to you it is actually being aware raising awareness of um of the potential gender differentials we're saying you're you're saying here as a you know as a kind of a person sitting in front of me that you like to treat people equitably um the thing is the world doesn't do that so recognizing the world doesn't do that and thinking okay what can i do to mitigate against some of that um unequal treatment by you know by the world so that might then help you adapt the way that you um coach the individual that's in front of you and it there was a fascinating uh conversation in that um in that series of uh uh podcasts with a male coach and he was talking about the kind of strategies he uses when he brings his uh you know when he brings himself into the coaching space with a woman and it was around thinking about those big frameworks thinking about the potential uh you know pow macro power dynamics um, that he's really very conscious of when he's um, in the coaching space. So I think it is about being aware of those those bigger pictures and how they might be impacting on the way that that person is treated in the world means that they may need to use slightly different strategies, that there may need to be some recognition, um, that they may be facing different kinds of discriminations. And of course, this isn't just about gender. It's, it, it can be about all sorts of different characteristics of people. Um, but it's simply it's having that awareness and having that recognition, I think. So I heard all of those words, but I can't imagine what I would change based on what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, I, most people who know me would say that I have no emotions and, and I think about things as logically as you possibly can. Um, and so when I teach people about pricing and value, I'm usually focused on what's the value to the customer. Mm -hmm. And, and so I don't do the big emotional sale. Hey, how do we build the relationship and how do we, um, and, and so I, I think I would teach women the exact same way I would teach men. Here's the value of your product. How mm -hmm. do we go sell that value? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm, I'm happy to be coached. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, what my guest with Robert Laycock was saying within that uh, piece was around um, the way that he brings himself into the space can be different. Um, and that could be about the way he is um, questioning that person, the way that he is um, even sits in the mm. space you know, in terms of he's a reasonably big guy, even that kind of that self-awareness of what could this be like? If you're in that position of supporting a person or teaching a person, um, what does that feel like to be on that other side if you are, uh, if you're kind of used to being told what to do uh, in, in kind of uh, – disrespectful ways if you've had kind of different experiences um so he talks about 
kind of, it's really quite a sort of a, it's very nuanced and kind of gentle ways of just adjusting the way that you might um, be approaching something with someone. So it's particularly in that kind of one-to-one scenario. Um, hmm. So it, yeah. I get, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say it would be interesting to see some of the way I coach and see if I change it for men versus women. I, I don't know if I do, hmm. um, but, but I'm lucky in that everybody I coach comes to me and wants help. Yeah. And, and so it's easier to, to do that. I was doing a presentation a, a week ago and my co-presenter just called on someone and said, tell us about your pricing situation. And my co-presenter, she'd picked a, a woman. And so she told us about her pricing situation. I made a couple of suggestions and it was almost like I offended her, right? She was not in a mindset that said, hey, I'm ready to be coached. And it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's why I only coach people who want to be coached. Yeah. Yeah. The being coachable question is absolutely vital, regardless of gender. (laughs) Um, Absolutely. You need to be ready for it and you need to be open to it and not defensive. Um, And so this is a lovely example, actually, on that presentation uh, last week, because it feels like that person, something, you know, touched that person, made them defensive. Um, So they were not open to your advice uh, and to that kind of... um, to that knowledge that they might actually be able to, to sort of adapt to. Um, and so there's something there about, you know, is there anything that, uh, I mean, you couldn't foresee that on a call, you weren't working with that person one-to-one, but is there anything then in our strategies, if we are working one-to-one that we can help? Okay. How, how can I just shift that approach? Something didn't land right there. So how can I shift that approach? Was that something was it something about gender going on? Was it something about another characteristic? Um, and just so that how that we can get the best out of that person in front of us as well. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, I've had similar experiences with men too, right? I mean, mm-hmm. so, so you have to be coachable. Um, yeah. In that, yeah. in that one situation, it did feel semi-gender related, but who knows, right? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, could be a whole multitude of factors going on in that scenario. And if there's other people in the space as well, as you're saying, as part of a presentation, that holds another another dynamic because it's sort of semi-public uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, where did you get – you probably said this in the beginning and I have a horrible memory. Um, where did you get the 43% difference um, in pay – is there a study? Can you send that to me so I can put the link in the show notes? Yes, I will certainly send it to you. It's from 2019, yeah, and it's from a body called Ipsy. So it's data on the, on the UK, um, independent professionals and self-employed. I will send you a link uh, definitely after the call. Yeah. yeah do, do, we ha- do you know, do we have a similar study in the U.S.? I'm not aware. Um, sorry, I very much, you know, kind of work in the UK context, mm-hmm. um, but it there must be some similar data, uh, one would hope. Um, and that I should, I'll just put a word of caution. That was kind of on day rates that people charge, which I know we're not um, interested in uh, necessarily for the uh, for this podcast. But there is no data around that kind of about setting the value based pricing. But I would think, how would that be? How would it be different? We, there must be some sort of differential there too. Um, yeah, it would be interesting if we understood the reasons for the day rate. We could certainly make inferences. Does that apply to the, exactly. the value-based pricing or not? Yeah, and, yeah. And so if we be- exactly because if we're talking about service-based, that we are talking about the value-based, really. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's what I'm going to take from that 43 percent number. Mm. If God, I think you're going to hate my answer. If I could <laughs> try me, <laughs> if I could help women price better they can get a 43% raise without working very hard at it. Yeah. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Sign me up. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Well, I tell you what, my favorite thing in the world is having impact on other people. And so Mm -hmm. what you're saying is I really need to work with women more than men because there's more opportunity for impact there. I get the free 43% before I start working on going above that. It is almost a free 43%, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's an interesting way of putting it, but yeah, it is. Uh, There's something there that's telling us um, 
but I guess yeah, you'd need to you'd need to be able to isolate what's going on with the men um, in order to to understand that difference, and that's is where we don't have that research. <laughs> Yeah, it would be really fascinating to know. Um, okay, Julie, we're going to start wrapping this up, but I'm going to ask you the final question that I ask everybody, even yeah. if it doesn't fit your world. Go on. What is one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? I would say take the risk. Take the risk and ask for it. I need to take my own advice there. Well. Take the risk. Well, so are we back to that? I don't want to hear no. Maybe we are underneath that um, and not being, not being scared of getting the no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. that's under that piece of advice, isn't it? Not being scared um, of getting the no. So someone I listen to quite regularly just wrote a new book and I don't, God, I don't remember the name of his book, but, um, but one of the things he said, which was so brilliant is Failure is not the opposite of success. Failure are your stepping stones to success. Mm, that's lovely. Yeah. That's and lovely. So how many times do we have to hear no so that we can get to yes? And no is just a stepping stone. Yeah. Julie, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Thank you, Mark. The easiest way is probably through LinkedIn, where they'll find me as uh, Dr. Julie Scanlon. Excellent. And to our listeners, thank you so much for your time. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.